they were just like friends because they, they obviously worked in Manchester and they'd be in two or three times a week. So you, you get to know the faces and, yeah, they were good. My floor was electrical, um, gardening. gardening, cups and saucers, that kind of thing. May's homeware department was on the first floor of the building. On the second floor, there was a restaurant, some offices, and in a relatively new venture for Woolworths, a furniture department. It was here, on the 8th of May, 1979, that a fire began. The dinner hour had started, so you had to keep moving your staff where the customers were, you know, so that's what we were actually doing. And I just saw one of the girls' supervisors coming down the escalator, and she shouts to me, May, May! Get out, there's a fire. And it was, the smoke was just coming down behind her. Me, I always think, when you see an advert on the telly, when they used to have that for Old Spice, and you used to see that like a water coming after that man that's going to go... And that just had, the smoke was just coming down the escalator over Kathleen's head, wasn't it? Mm. And it all happened very quickly, didn't it? Very yeah. quickly, Never yes. done anything so quick in my life. Never. Thera Beaumont worked in the offices on the second floor, near the restaurant and the furniture department. But when the fire started, she was on the floor above. As I came back down the stairs, that's when I met all these people surging down the stairs. And I had no option but to, to go with them. I couldn't have got past them. Mm. I had to go. They were all surging downstairs, and I didn't know why, what had happened. I was compelled to go with them mm. or get killed in the rush. And when you got outside, what was going on outside? Mm, chaos, wasn't it? When we got out and we had to go to... We were supposed to go to Licklewoods, but you had to get all your staff together before you could do that. And you're getting your staff together, and I couldn't find Ivy, and I'm going, I'm, I'm not, I, I've not seen her, I've not seen her, I'm going berserk, and I... One of the Kathleen that came down the stairs, she said, I've just seen your Ivy. I said, well, bring Ivy to me. And it was seemingly, she said, I must have gone a bit hysterical not finding Ivy. And Kath slapped my face from me. And then we were all, all had to go in Little Woods then, didn't we? When, we got all, when you got your girls together and you knew you'd got your girls, then you had to go into um, the basement of Little Woods. The large building we're looking at here on Piccadilly Gardens is the Woolworths building. Uh, in 1979, of course, it was a very popular store. That's now changed. It's now an amusement arcade. But the facade of the building is very much the same as it was. Ken Ward has spent 40 years on the road, travelling around the northwest of England as a cameraman for the BBC. But on the day of the Woolworths fire, the story couldn't have been closer. The BBC was actually just round the corner from here. We were based in uh, an old bank building. Uh, and our building actually adjoined the Woolworths store, which is on the corner of Piccadilly and Oldham Street. On the 8th of May 1979, I'd actually been on an assignment in the town centre, another part of the town centre, and I'd been called across to investigate the reports of a fire. On arriving here, we noticed that there was smoke issuing from the top of the building. We'd been able to smell that smoke for quite some time before we uh, actually arrived at the scene, because it had a very sickly sort of smell and taste to it. it got it at the back of your throat. On May the 8th, 1979, I was a senior divisional officer in Greater Manchester Fire Service and I was working at headquarters, which is about uh, 10 minutes at the most from uh, the city centre. I was told that uh, we'd received a call to Woolworths on Piccadilly. The scene that met Bob Graham when he arrived in the city centre is still fresh in his mind. And the police were in attendance, the fire brigade were in attendance ambulances. As we say in the fire service, it was going well. Uh, there was fire and flames and smoke coming out of all the second floor windows. So you're talking about the fire going well rather than the rescue operation? That's right, that's mm. right. We assumed people were still trapped in the building. Uh, we always do that. And so we had breathing apparatus teams going at three separate points of the three staircases. And uh, the conditions were extremely, extremely uh, dangerous. At that time, the, the smoke and, uh, in, in one instance, the flames were coming down the staircase to mm. the first floor level. What kind of smoke was it? It was black, thick black, pumping out as though there were huge pumps inside the building pumping the stuff out. 
What that meant for staff on the upper floors soon became clear to journalists struggling to report from the streets below. Firemen are trying to manoeuvre uh, an adjustable hoist platform towards one of the windows, a barred window, several of them on the second floor, where we can see people crushed up against the bars, waving out of the windows, shouting for help. Smoke's now pouring from the window, coming from behind them, and obviously the room they're in is very thick indeed. I can see them coughing, choking and screaming for help. These people working in the offices didn't know there was a fire. And when they finally became aware of something wrong, they opened the door from their offices onto the furniture floor, and of course, that was, you know, engulfed in flames and thick smoke. So she closed the door and went to the windows and found they were barred for security reasons, because that was where the money was kept. I can remember vividly seeing through the, the camera lens, it's almost second sight now, I can almost visualise that there was the hand, particularly the woman's hand with the handkerchief, people just two arms out, there was a, a chap wearing a suit, if I think, and his arms were out and he was just trying to attract attention. The fire brigade were obviously trying their best, but even when they got access up to the point, they then couldn't free the bars. So there was a, a fair bit of consternation from both the fire brigade, the people that were watching, and, and clearly the people that were involved with the fire inside. When we was going down, it was all smoke, and we couldn't see anything. So we just headed back up, and the smoke was following us, like, you know what I mean? So we then we ended up on the roof. I just don't know how the other stuff got out as hell, you know what I mean? Because there was smoke all over the place. Started panicking when the smoke started. I thought the roof was just going to collapse, you know what I mean? And we was all going to go down, you know what I mean? Could you breathe easily? No. No. No way. How did you cope up there then? Just put, you know, me jumper over my face. face. You know what I mean? Breathe through the jumper. What were the other people uh, doing? Panicking, but we told them to calm down. In fact, it was looking back at it. It was it was a very efficient job because we had. I think almost 30 people trapped behind bars or on the roof of the building and uh, they were rescued within 15 minutes of the call. I was the the toilet door to come out. Oh, all the black smoke, we couldn't get me, out, so I was trapped, trapped in the toilet upstairs. You don't work there, you were just there no, for no, a meal? No, we had been meal. For a meal, we'd been shopping. We just trapped, and we couldn't coming. move, we had to smash the windows we in the toilet. We smashed the window and shouted for help. Anyway, the fire engines come and everybody seemed as though they was out then. Barry knows and then the fire engines come and they, they come up the ladders and got us down the ladders. It was a little bit of a logistic nightmare covering the story itself because in those days we were on film. One of the problems with film as opposed to video is of course it has to be processed and that's a considerable amount of time. And we were then looking towards deadlines for the very last bit of film we could pop into the processing uh, machinery to get it back in time for that evening's programme. We were lucky in that our processing labs were in Lever Street, which were only two streets away. So we had a system of runners here who were literally gathering film from us, running it round to the processing labs, processing it, and then another series of runners taking it back to the studio so that it was almost as, as live as we could make it in those days. At first, for the news crews on the ground, the big story seemed to be the rescue of the office workers behind the bars. Later, though, it became clear that it was the people in the restaurant close to the seat of the fire who had faced the greatest risk. There were about 500 people in the building, all told. A lot of them were in the restaurant, which was on the second floor. And there was no separation between the restaurant and the furniture sales area. Right. Uh, the access that was mainly used was an escalator from the first floor up to the second. And that was right in the middle of the floor. So when the fire started, uh, the smoke obscured all the lighting. It was immediately dark. Um, and it spread across the underside of the ceiling and then came down on the perimeter walls, as it does. We call it mushrooming in the fire service. It comes down as it cools when it hits the exterior wall and then it's drawn back into the fire and superheating. That's the, the sequence of a fire development. So if you're stuck inside, it's like a huge black canopy That's right. going right around you. Yeah. Completely and, confusing you. Yeah, and the thing is, people were making their way to the exits, then would have to go through more difficult conditions than they were leaving. Because as they approached the exits, the smoke was thicker. Mm. And that's why we found nine people near the exit to Oldham Street. 
on the second floor. By the time the evening programme was ready to be broadcast, it was a slightly strange atmosphere in the studio. It was much hotter than normal. I mean, obviously, we have lights in there which generate heat. But the problem was that one wall of the studio actually adjoined the Woolworths building. And it was that warm, you physically could not keep your hand on it. You could feel it through the you could, you could, Well, you, you really could feel it. The wall was red hot. And this was probably three hours, four hours after the main body of the fire had been damped down. Um, so it brought it home to us all, you know, just how close we'd been to this story. It was right next door and it was still having an effect on the, our bulletin. Um, by the fact that the studio was red hot. And that evening, the television news confirmed that ten people had died in the fire, the nine customers in the restaurant and a member of staff whose body was found near the furniture department. Six of the customers were elderly people, three were in their 20s and early 30s. In the aftermath, poignant personal stories emerged. The employee was a man in his 60s who had opted to work that day so he could have the coming Saturday off to watch Manchester United in the FA Cup final. He died trying to guide customers out of the restaurant. One of the younger casualties was a bride-to-be out shopping with her fiancé's sister. Both women lost their lives. It was exceptional for people to die in a central city large store. It's not so incredible that a fire occurred, but for people to not be able to get out when the fire was seen, I felt, was exceptional. In 1979, Leonard Gorodkin was the Manchester coroner in charge of the inquest into the deaths which opened that September. He wanted to understand why so many people had died so quickly. Fire officer Bob Graham, who led the official investigation into the disaster, was certain that the answer lay in the kind of furniture Woolworths had been selling. It was different to the traditional furniture that I remember, you know, horsehair, spring interior. Yeah. This was foam-filled stuff, and uh, whilst it made furniture, you know, cheap and very comfortable, and people who could never have afforded three-piece suites were able to, it had this side effect of burning very quickly. To Bob Graham, what had happened at Woolworths was a domestic furniture fire on a grand scale. What threw us all, I think, uh, was the speed of the fire. Because within, I think the coroner made the comment, within two or three minutes from the fire starting, no one was getting off that floor alive. For more than a decade before the Woolworths fire, the number of fatal house fires in the Manchester area had been rising alarmingly. Bob Graham and his colleagues knew it wasn't just the speed at which the new kind of furniture burned, but the smoke it produced that was killing people. The nature of this smoke is if you take one breath, it, it makes you wretch uh, mm. and you gasp and you take a, br a bigger breath. And that's what puts people down in these fires. You know? So it's very quick. I mean, it's, it's a, well, few, a few lungfuls and, and your ability to get yourself out has gone That's right, else. one lungful. Uh, and, and that's you on the floor. And if you're not pulled out or if you can't make your way out, that's where you take on the carbon monoxide, mm. and, and that's what ultimately kills you. The sadness of it was that the suddenness, a normal fire without the smoke would have been OK. I, I don't think there would have been any loss of life. It had just been a fire. It's a question that the fire uh, was in this furniture, which produced these massive volumes of, of smoke that, that led to the deaths. The inquest also heard how a simple misunderstanding at a critical moment meant that the fire brigade weren't called as soon as the fire was discovered. I think it was the floor manager who ran into the office on that floor and said, there's a fire on the floor. But the girl on the switchboard thought he said, there's a fight on the floor. So she didn't call the fire brigade. Mm. We didn't receive a call from Woolworths. There was no call from inside the building at no, all? No, no. The, the first call to the fire brigade was from a taxi driver who was passing on Piccadilly and saw the smoke coming out of the windows. And given what you said about the speed with which that sort of fire can take hold, those minutes presumably were crucial? They were, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, looking back at it, although we didn't know at the time, um, the people who died were probably not going to get out when we receive a call. Mm -hmm. You know, that's how quickly these fires grow. The day of the fire, I was relieving on the switchboard 
Mm. But I wasn't on the switchboard all the time. I was just relieving that day. At that particular moment, <laughs> I'd gone upstairs and asked somebody to relieve me. There had to be somebody on the switchboard all the time. And I was only upstairs, matter of minutes, really. It was only minutes I was away. The person who was working the switchboard for you, right. someone ran in and shouted, fire. But well, she heard fight. Yeah, she obviously, this person didn't hear right what was being said for a split second. I mean, you did get ruffians from time to time that security would deal with and uh, it wouldn't be a problem. And what about the way the Woolworth staff and management reacted in those couple of minutes that they had to, to deal with it? Uh, they were up against it. I remember the, I think it was a district manager who happened to be there. He took a hose reel and, and tried to tackle the fire, but, but he stood no chance, mm. you know. Um, valiant effort, and I remember seeing him. He was black with smoke when he came out. Um, so, you know, they did what they could. Woolworths itself, the, the company, would give all its employees information booklets about uh, alarms and fires and things and what to do, but all their information started once you hear the alarm. There was no teaching, if, if you see it, as far as I could tell, from what I learned at the time, start and press the alarm before you do anything. As a result, nobody said fire, nobody broke a break glass alarm point until the fire was well on its way and coming down into the first floor. It took a long time for the fire alarm to be set off, didn't it? Mm, yeah. But even without the sound of a fire alarm, wasn't the sight of the smoke and the advice of staff that they should leave the building enough to alert the elderly people eating in the restaurant of the danger they were in? It was a popular restaurant and it was popular because it was quite cheap. Uh, and it was a cafeteria-style restaurant. Mm. Uh, and so people could arrange to meet there, you know, and have, have the lunch there. And it was lunchtime, of course. But the problem with that kind of situation was that um, there were people, they'd paid for the meal. Uh, and they were sitting down with the meal. And they were reluctant to leave it when someone said there's a fire because they'd paid for it. There was one man in the restaurant who later... Uh, was found was a man of 71 uh, who would be a regular there. Uh, the impression was that he didn't have uh, a lot of family uh, and that this was part of his enjoyment. He'd gone to the restaurant, got his soup and a roll and the staff there who were later interviewed uh, said yes, they knew him, he was a regular. And when a member of the restaurant said come on, there's, there's a fire going on over there. He said, yes, I can see, but I'm, I'm going to have my soup. And that was the last comment to him or, or from him. And uh, I think he was found where he was sitting. You know, his bowl of soup was still on the table. Nothing, the tables weren't burned or anything. The fire was 30, 40 yards away. It's purely the, the smoke that came across and killed him. But he, he was a regular, did see the fire, was told about it, but couldn't see the danger. For this reason, the Woolworths fire is often used by psychologists as an example of the way people behave once they're in large shops, designed specifically to make customers want to stay in the building and keep shopping. But this is not the fire's most significant legacy. In the tragedy, Bob Graham saw an opportunity to save thousands of lives in the future. The next day, when we were investigating in daylight, if you like, I rang a scientist at the fire research station and asked if he could come up because I, was, I thought there was something special about this fire. And so they sent a team up and that led to us doing a, a reconstruction of the Woolworths fire in a huge hangar in, at Cardington in Bedfordshire. We got Woolworths to identify the furniture in that particular area. We built a rig, or the scientists did, and we put the furniture in it and set fire to it. 
And what happened when you when you set fire to it? Well, um, it was I was a little nervous. Uh, there were a lot of interesting parties there, legal representatives of the different parties involved in any possible legal action after this, fire specialists, architects, scientists, and so on. And I remember one of them coming up to me and said, well, hey, yeah, Bob, what's going to happen? And I said, well, I don't think you're going to be stood here in three minutes. And we're inside the hangar. And it, I don't think you've been to it. It's huge. So they set fire to it and it went so fast, they lost one of the cameras on the tripod. So you set fire to this pile of fire? Yeah, we just, we just put a match to it and went out and watched it burn. And within two or three minutes, it was Woolworths all over again. At the inquest, I showed a film of that test, went on for a few minutes. First of all, the flames shot high, virtually to the ceiling, and after about a, a minute of burning, the smoke started from the, the contents of these uh, units, and it was voluminous. And within two minutes, it really was incredible, the, the amount of, of smoke which had carbon monoxide and, and poisonous fumes in it. Armed with this evidence about the deadly nature of foam-filled furniture, Bob Graham began to campaign for a change in the law to ensure the use of safer materials. But there was strong opposition from the furniture industry, and it wasn't until 1988, nearly a decade after the Woolworths fire, that legislation requiring manufacturers to use flame-resistant foam finally came into force. There have been some dreadful fires in the meantime, and not far from here in Bury there was... Nine people died in a fire on Christmas Eve, a furniture fire. And uh, these were happening in Wales, you know, there were some very emotive speeches by chief fire officers up and down the country. Fifteen years after its introduction, the law was estimated to have saved over 4,000 lives. I think the Woolworths fire was a catalyst. It wasn't a domestic fire. And it gave you an example to hold up to people? It did, because it was... Ten people at once, God bless them, and whereas domestic fires were mainly one or two and, you know, they were just a small item in the newspaper. In a long career as a BBC cameraman, Ken Ward has covered plenty of big stories. But 30 years on, the Woolworths fire is one that stays with him. It's been a spectacular fire because of the smoke, but when you realise the tragedy that had unfurled itself here in front of the public... Um, it really sort of took its toll. You went home thinking, well, it's, it's, you know, I've been involved in a big event, but it's a disastrous event. These people lost their lives, and for what, you know. The cause of the Woolworths fire was never established. At the inquest, a Home Office forensic expert put forward an elaborate theory concerning some wiring behind a stack of furniture. The coroner, Leonard Garodkin, wasn't convinced. He came up with a possible cause that a plug in the wall that had been used to light various units on the floor where this fire started had in some way rubbed across some coving at the corner of an upright that the wire had worn away and it had shorted but that wouldn't have caused a fire and that there was probably something like a bit of fluff that had got into the area and that the fluff had, had lit. And the fire started, as was known, in furniture that was stored. This expert felt that the, the plug, which was on the wall near where this furniture was, may have lit the polythyrene cover that the furniture had. That's quite a sequence of events, though, isn't it? That's the, right. There the had flex, to be. The fluff and, and on top of everything, I seem to remember, there would have to have been some slight shaking, maybe over a thousandth of a second, to produce this. So this may have been from lorries going past outside. I, in summing up, said that this was no more than a slight possibility and not a probability at all. The fire officers felt that it was likely to be from a naked flame. They did various tests on similar lots of furniture and didn't think it was started by a discarded cigarette. We never actually found out really how it happened, did we? No. 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 We never got to know properly. You heard little different things. You don't know, really, do you? After the fire, Woolworth staff like May Chipchase, Ivy Bond and Vera Beaumont 
just wanted to get back to normal. We did get shipped out for a little while till our own store was rebuilt again and then we were all brought back. And how did that feel going back? Good. Coming home. Coming home. This is very nice, really. Mm -hmm. It's nice to all be back together again, to be truthful. But did you talk about the fire amongst yourselves when you got back oh, together? Yes. Yeah, oh, God, eh? <laughs> talk about Where the fire. Where was you? Where was you? Where was you? Where you? <laughs> <laughs> that was every dinner when you went back, wasn't it, for a while? Till it, till it wore off, like, a bit, you know. Mm. But uh, after that, though, if you went anywhere, like, for a meal or anything, first thing you was looking for, where's the exit door before we sit down, you know what I mean, wasn't it? Mm. So um, it had unnerved you a lot. It was like only yesterday. Yes, you do remember it, yeah. I think it's something that you will always be there. And it's just as though it happened last week. And it just seems all so real, yeah. Mm. In Living Memory was presented by Chris Ledyard and produced in Bristol by Isabel Eaton. A timid man confronts mindless bureaucracy when he applies for an allotment. Nick Warburton's comedy Turf Wars is coming up after we've heard from Winifred Robinson the details of you and yours. They were just like friends because they, they obviously worked in Manchester and they'd be in two or three times a week. So you, you get to know the faces and, yeah, they were good. My floor was the electrical... Um, gardening. Gardening, cups and saucers, that kind of thing. May's homeware department was on the first floor of the building. On the second floor, there was a restaurant, some offices and in a relatively new venture for Woolworths, a furniture department. It was here, on the 8th of May, 1979, that a fire began. The dinner hour had started, so you had to keep moving your staff where the customers were, you know. On the floor above. As I came back down the stairs, that's when I met all these people surging down the stairs. And I had no option but to to go with them. I couldn't have got past them. Mm. I had to go. They were all surging downstairs and I didn't know why, what had happened. I was compelled to go with them mm. or get killed in the rush. And when you got outside, what was going on outside? Going in chaos, wasn't it? When we got out and we had to go to, we were supposed to go to Licklewoods, but you had to get all your stuff together before, so that's what we were actually doing. And I just saw one of the girls' supervisors coming down the escalator and she shouts to me, May, May, get out, there's a fire. And it was, the smoke was just coming down behind her. Me, I always think, when you see an advert on the telly, when they used to have that for Old Spice and you used to see that like a water coming after that man that's going to go... And that just had, the smoke was just coming down the escalator on, over Kathleen's head, wasn't it? Mm. And it all happened very quickly, didn't it? Very yeah. quickly. Never yes. done anything so quick in my life. Never. Vera Beaumont worked in the offices on the second floor, near the restaurant and the furniture department. But when the fire started, she was... Now ...an amusement arcade, but the facade of the building is very much the same as it was. Ken Ward has spent 40 years on the road, travelling around the northwest of England as a cameraman for the BBC. But on the day of the Woolworths fire, the story couldn't have been closer. The BBC was actually just round the corner from here. We were based in uh, an old bank building, uh, and our building actually adjoined the Woolworth store, which is on the corner of Piccadilly and Oldham Street. On the 8th of May 1979, I'd actually been on an assignment in the town centre, another part of the town centre, and I'd been called across to investigate the reports of a fire. On arriving here, we noticed... We could do that. 
you're getting your staff together, and I couldn't find Ivy. And I'm going, I'm, I'm not, I, I've not seen her, I've not seen her. I mean, I'm going berserk. And I, one of the Kathleen that came down the stairs, she said, I've just seen your Ivy. I said, well, bring <laughs> Ivy to me. And we see my lady, she slapped, I must have gone a bit hysterical not finding Ivy. And Kath slapped my face from me. And then we were all, all had to go in Little Woods then, didn't mm. we? Got all, when you got your girls together and you knew you'd got your girls, then you all had to go into um, the basement of Little Woods. The large building we're looking at here on Piccadilly Gardens is the Woolworths building. Uh, in 1979, of course, it was a very popular store. That's now changed. It's 